Hello, my name is Dan Merrick, and I'll be your Ruby instructor today for Plant-Based Holiday Meals Live event. I personally have a background in plant-based cooking and have worked in that field for the past 15 years for companies like Whole Foods Market, nonprofits like Whole Kids Foundation. Many culinary schools, I run my own vegan catering company and currently sit on the board for Slow Food and the Institute of Child Nutrition. Today, we're actually gonna be talking about plant-based alternative dishes for the holidays and how you can use them I'll feature a few of these recipes and you can find them in the attachment under this video. There'll also be a recording of this if you wanna go back and view the recipes again. Before we start our class on holiday meals, there are a couple housekeeping items. On the right hand top of your page, you'll see a dialogue box that says add question here. If you're inspired to ask a question or make a comment, type it in and it'll make its way to the queue and you'll see on the right hand side of the page. You can also upvote the questions by hitting the heart-shaped icon and the individual questions will we answer will be with the more votes will actually come up a little bit sooner and you'll see them at the top of the page. But let's get started with our holiday menus. From Thanksgiving to Hanukkah, Christmas and Kwanzaa, there are a lot of holiday items that can be easily manipulated to turn them into plant-based alternatives that can still bring back flavor memories from your past years or gatherings. I personally love the holiday season because it brings people together and celebrates the diversity, the diversity of our tables in one meal. This year might look a little different with the pandemic going on, but if you're plant-based, that means you don't have to worry about any restrictive diets except for your own. The holiday season is actually a time when decadence tends to take over the plates. There are a lot of ways to make the holidays just a little bit healthier, including no oil. We'll do a few of those, but we'll also do a few that are on the decadent side. We'll go over some recipes from beginning to end today, and I will open it up to questions how to make substitutions to dishes that you have questions about. With that being said, let's move to the kitchen so I can show you some of my holiday favorites. I think the mushroom gravy is one of the cornerstones of any holiday meal. It's something you can literally put over anything. We're going to start with a dry pan and add an entire onion diced. We're going to cook it until it's translucent. And then we're going to add in some garlic, some thyme, and rosemary, and cook that for an additional 30 seconds. Then we'll add our mushrooms. I've used shiitake, button, and a mix of other mushrooms, and cook for about two more minutes until the mixture begins to stick a little bit. Then we'll add our wine to deglaze the pan and cook for about four minutes until the liquid is reduced. Then I'm gonna add my mushroom powder, nutritional yeast, a little apple cider vinegar, and tamari. I'll prepare a slurry of gluten-free flour and vegetable stock and add it to thicken it up. And then I'll add a little bit of flour as time goes on to thicken it up as needed. These maple glazed sweet potatoes are actually the ruby recipe for maple glazed yams. We just changed it up a little. It's really simple, it's just a little bit of veg broth right here. I'm going to add in some salt, some nutmeg, a little bit of cinnamon, some pepper, and maple syrup. Now typically this actually uses olive oil or any kind of an oil instead of the vegetable broth, but I wanted to make another no oil version of this. After I get this all mixed together, I'm just going to pour it over the top and then use a big spoon to be able to toss my sweet potatoes in it. I want to make sure they get nice and covered before I put them out on my sheet tray. Now, you might think that this is a little crowded, which it is, but we're just gonna put it in for a little bit longer at 375 for about 45 to 50 minutes. Halfway through, I'm gonna take them out, toss them, and then put them back in. This is a great side, and it's very popular, a nice conversion into a vegan version of a popular holiday recipe. 
Another holiday favorite is potato latke. Starting off with a large grater, I'm using my food processor specifically because it just makes it a lot easier. You can also just use a cheese grater if you want to. You simply just put the potatoes in after you slice them down to size. Once they go in, they grate really easy. I only need two cups to be able to make this recipe, but it only makes four latke. So if you want to double the recipe, if you have a larger crowd, that's totally okay. Now, one of the most important things for making this recipe is trying to get all the liquid out of the potatoes. So I'm going to put them into a towel and then wring that towel out until I get most of the liquid out of those potatoes. You can see there's actually quite a bit there. Now, once I've gotten all the liquid out, I'm going to take them out of the bowl here and then put them into a clean bowl. I'm going to add my green onion, some flour to start out, mix it up a little bit. Then I'll put in my salt some cornstarch, a little baking powder. My friend Ken says that every Jewish grandmother says you need to put fresh nutmeg in, so that's going in too. I just add a little black pepper and our almond milk. I'm gonna mix it by hand and then get ready for the pan. Now this is a full oil recipe, so it's definitely indulgent. We're basically deep frying here. I'm just browning the underside and then flipping them, and then putting them onto a paper towel to dry off some of that oil. You can serve with some of the green onions and a little bit of vegan sour cream, and you're good to go. These wine glazed Brussels sprouts are something I do all year round, actually. First thing you want to do is shave the Brussels sprouts. Next, we're going to saute our onions. We're not going to do a full caramelization, just start them out. This is a great recipe because it's actually really quick to come together. The whole thing can be done in less than 10 minutes and really quick. The next thing we're going to add to this is going to be our red pepper. And we're going to let this steam saute just a little bit. Again, no liquid in here, just letting the natural sugars and the natural juices come out of the vegetables. Next, we're actually going to add our Brussels sprouts over the top of this. Just let some of that moisture cook from the bottom up. Then add our salt and pepper. And then I'll toss the entire mixture. Now I'm going to add my white wine to basically steam saute the entire thing and get a nice rich aroma. Now we want to make sure not to overcook these. You still want a little bit of al dente and a little bit of crunch to some of the larger pieces of Brussels sprouts. Now this mushroom wellington has been a showstopper for me for years. It's actually pretty simple. It's based off an award-winning recipe I found. I just switched it up a little bit to be able to make it my own. Starting out just by doing some no-oil onions and some mushrooms in a saute pan. I'm going to stir those every so often. When they start to stick a little bit, I'm just going to deglaze with a little bit of vegetable stock. I'm using frozen spinach so I don't even have to cook it. It's off to the side, just thawing out. But I do have to prepare my portobellas. I just want to trim the bottom of the mushroom off just to get rid of that woodiness, and then get rid of the gills on the underside using a spoon. I'm going to do this to three portobellas. Then I'm going to put them into my saute pan and basically steam them in some vegetable broth. I'm going to have to add some vegetable broth to be able to make sure that they don't stick. Now I'm just going to do a quick saute on this because they're actually going to cook with inside the Wellington. Now it's time to get our puff pastry together and start assembling. Start out with a layer of spinach, then mushrooms, then our herbs. We're going to add the portobellas, and then stuff the bottom of the mushroom with their spinach and mushroom mixture, and then pack it around the sides of the mushrooms as well. Add more herbs to the top, and then we'll use the remaining mushroom mixture to pack the top of the portobellas and around the sides of the Wellington. Then we're going to fold up our pastry. This actually is a little difficult because, well, in this case, I packed it too full. 
So I'm gonna flip it over, put another pastry sheet in, and then score the top of it. After I scored the top, I'm gonna to mix in just a little bit of aquafaba, maple syrup, almond milk, and just a tiny little bit of oil. As I blend that up here, I'm gonna use this as my egg wash, essentially, to be able to make sure it browns over the top. I'll put it in the oven, 350 for about 45 minutes and it comes out nice and crispy. Now when you slice into this, it actually is an amazing look. You get the portabella right in the center to be able to show off how great this dish can be. Or even if you stuff it a little too full. So these are just a, full, a few examples of plant-based meals that I'll be enjoying for the holidays. But there are many other staples that people like and would love to hear some of your ideas or questions about converting traditional mains and sides into plant-based versions. So right now I'm gonna open it up for questions to see what kind of ideas come up. So again, um, just all you have to do is type in your questions. You can upvote different questions so they'll come up as well. And I can see my first one here is from Marina. And the question is yams versus sweet potatoes. There seem to be some different labels and definitions out there. Can you use them interchangeably? So yeah, there actually um, are two different things, a sweet potato versus a yam. The sweet potato, um, you know, is kind of got a, like a moist flesh on the outside. Uh, the yam is definitely a little more dry. It's a starchy flesh. It's kind of like a bark-like skin too, um, where the sweet potato has a much slicker appearance on the outside of it as well. Now, they all come in a multitude of different colors, too. So you'll find, uh, you know, an orange version of both the sweet potato um, and a yam as well. They do work pretty easily, um, you know, interchangeable. But the the yam, I, I tend to find is a little more dry than the sweet potato, where the sweet potato you can like whip really easy as well, too, depending on what you, you know, put into it. But on both of them, they have a huge uh, variety of different appearances. Um, some have different nu nutrition as well, too. Um, and there'll be different flavors um, and profiles for each one of them. So do they work um, interchangeably? A little bit. Um, I'm a bigger fan of the sweet potato just because of the creaminess you can get out of that. So um, that would probably be my preference. And that's why I did the sweet potato for this recipe instead of the yam. But great question um, and something very commonly asked. So I'm glad you asked it. Our next one is I've seen recipes that suggest if you can't make flax egg, use applesauce. Is the result the same? Um, also, I have an egg replacer powder and water that can be used instead of flax with egg, the same results. So um, that's a great question. So I've been using egg replacers for a long time, and there are really different uses for each one of them. So if I was going to make a flax egg, uh, flax eggs are typically about a one tablespoon to three tablespoon, you know, or take one tablespoon of flax to three tablespoon of water. And you let that sit for a little bit, um, stir it up, and it becomes a great egg replacer. Now, I typically will use a flax egg replacer in something a little bit more dense, like cookies. And so if you're doing something like, I don't know, like a chocolate chip cookie or something, I would actually use a golden flax. So they don't show up as much and they're not little brown specks in it as well. Now, the applesauce is something that you would typically to be able to make something a little bit more moist, right? So um, that is like a, actually a great replacer that I use quite often in things like banana breads and stuff like that. Um, you know, so that's a wonderful egg replacer for that. As you saw in the, the Wellington, I actually used an aquafaba, um, you know, which is uh, just the the water from the can of chickpeas that they've been sitting in um, drained off and you just use the water in that. And I mixed it with a couple other things. I put a little almond milk in just to get the little bit of fat because the aquafaba has a protein, but it doesn't have a fat. A little bit of oil just to let it stick as well. But I put a tiny, tiny little bit of oil in there just to be able to make an egg wash to be able to help the outside of that Wellington brown a little bit more. Um, as far as the egg replacer and powder that you have, you know, there are different kinds that are out there. So I'm not really familiar with the one that you have, but I know that there are a lot out there and they um, will take things from all different sources. You know, they um, will, uh, you know, do 
you know, flax, or I've even seen dried apple stuff as, as well, but it really um, takes a little bit of experimentation with those to be able to see which one. If you do a quick search on um, egg replacers, you'll see that there's a huge variety out there from the three that I just mentioned. There's also, um, you know, you could do vegan yogurts as well. Chia seeds are another common one. Um, baking soda and vinegar combinations, you know, both of those um, to be able to make things a little bit more light and fluffy, um, you know, so all of those things I've used in different ways. I, I use the baking soda and baking powder actually in my um, uh, lock key um, to be able to help bind those a little bit more too. But great question um, and a lot of different uses for those. And it's, um, you know, I, I would just kind of pick depending on which egg replacer you're using for each recipe as well. But they all kind of work interchangeably. You just get a little slightly different result for each one of those. But great question. Um, the most efficient way to peel a mango. So that's great. Actually, uh, wow, it's been probably like 10 years ago. I did a video for Whole Foods Market on how to peel a mango, and it was the number one viewed thing on Whole Foods Market's uh, YouTube. Um, the way I like to do it is I'll actually um, you know, slice right down the center next to the, the pit of it and be able to peel it in half. And then I'll do um, a cross pattern on the knife and then be able to flip it inside out. And then you can just easily cut the little pieces of mango out on the inside. I've seen a lot of other versions where you could actually just cut it in half down the pit as well and take a cup and just scoop out the, the meat of the mango as well. Um, that, you know, uh, sometimes works. Uh, that's why I like just doing cutting it in half, getting rid of the pit, and then doing the, the cross hatches on the inside and then flipping that skin inside out. And what it does is it makes all those little cuts come out so you can easily cut them out to get them across. Um, so that's definitely my easiest way that I found to do it. And it's definitely proven itself uh, over time. Um, you have a recipe, and our next question here is a recipe that calls for molasses. Is there a substitute I can use? So, um, I'm not 100% sure on the, you know, if you're looking for a replacement for molasses that's plant-based, because molasses is plant-based. It's typically a drive from, um, you know, beets or a sugar of some sort uh, to be able to get kind of like a deeper consistency on that. And it turns that kind of darker color. So it's just like an extra, you know, when you're processing sugar, it's an extra amount of extraction um, and age to the plant a little bit too. But um, so I'm not 100% sure why you know, the substitution for molasses, if you're looking for something um, where you just can't have molasses, um, you know, I would have to do a little bit of research on that. Um, I've known, you know, people to make their own as well, because there are a lot of benefits to it, but uh, it typically would be a vegan product or a plant-based product. So molasses, a lot of people would be confused by it, thinking that's not a plant-based, but it actually is. Um, you know, basically what you're looking for is like a dark sugary substitute. So my best bet to make a replacement for it would be something like date paste or a dried fruit paste where you just take the dried fruit, just put a little bit of water into it, into a blender, um, and then you have a great paste. And that would be a nice thickness of that sweetness that you're looking for. So depending on the recipe, that's probably what I would do would be a date paste or an apricot paste or something like that as well, too. But great question again there. Our next one is, I'm interested in brunch ideas. That's a great one. Um, so, you know, for brunch ideas, there are a, a wide variety of things I like to do. I've been kind of experimenting with uh, uh, chickpea batter um, and making egg substitutes out of those as well. So um, that's actually a, uh, a wonderful way to be able to make some of the items that you're used to um, as far as eggs go. So um, you can do soup kind of souffles with it. You can do, um, you know, scrambled eggs, or I love to do omelets with them, which is a great way to be able to do that. And then just do some, like maybe some potatoes, some hassle packed potatoes or something like that. Um, and switch it up a little bit. Just think of what you typically look for in your brunch and just convert a little bit on those. The big hard one I think is the eggs to be able to make like an omelet or something like that. But I found really great success in the, um, uh, the garbanzo bean flour, which is a great uh, suggestion on that too. And I see Fran um, just uh, wrote in here too, suggesting um, shilan, a date syrup or sorghum to replace the molasses. So thanks Fran, one of our instructors um, here just gave a great recommendation for that, for the replacement for um, uh, the molasses. So thanks Fran for adding into that as well too. Our next one is what is a good vegan eggnog recipe? So 
Um, there are a lot of different recipes out there, but I typically will start with a non-dairy milk, something um, that has a fat consistency to it, because you'd really need that in the eggnog. So I typically go with an, um, an almond milk. Um, and I usually get, start out with a, uh, an unsweetened almond milk, but you can also get one sweetened um, with the vanilla, because uh, vanilla extract is definitely one of those things you want to add to your eggnog. Um, then I'll typically take that uh, almond milk and put on a little bit of coconut milk as well. So we'll say maybe like three cups of non-dairy milk and maybe a one can of coconut milk. And then maybe about, you want a little more sweet in there. So uh, I'd probably do maybe about three to four tablespoons of maple syrup. And then we're going to do our spices, right? So uh, typical spices are going to be cinnamon, nutmeg, uh, vanilla. And I love cardamom in mine. Not everybody does, but that's, uh, you know, a great addition to those. So on each one of those spices, maybe a half a teaspoon of cinnamon, maybe a quarter teaspoon of nutmeg, fresh if you can get it. I love it that way. About a teaspoon of vanilla. Um, and then if you're going to make the adult version, um, a little bit of bourbon, which is always, I love bourbon. It doesn't have to be a fancy bourbon or anything super, you know, expensive, but about an ounce uh, of bourbon per eight ounce serving. And you can always add that to the end, you know, so if you're making it for a family event and not everybody drinks alcohol, you can, um, you know, add the bourbon into the eggnog mix afterwards. So, um, and that's just kind of eggnog recipe, you know, off the top of my head, kind of like going through those. So that's probably what I would say um, for the eggnog recipe. Um, Hi, Chef Dan, looking for a plant-based entree ideas. No oil, please. I made the Harvest Veggie Loaf, which is great. Um, homemade cranberry sauce for Thanksgiving. Thank you for sharing your ideas with us today. Um, happy holidays. So um, I'm glad that you made the veggie loaf. That's actually a great one to do. Um, you know, I love doing the Wellington as well. Uh, I think that's one of my kind of standard favorites and the family loves it so much. So um, I definitely go towards that one quite often. Um, you know, as far as other mains go, there are a lot of different ideas if you think outside the box. It doesn't have to be like the loaf, so to say, um, but you can do, you know, a lot of different um, holidays celebrate kinds of different foods. So, um, you know, for, I know in Kwanzaa, it's a very plant-based, you know, focused on things like that. So looking at a wide variety of those. In fact, I almost did a Southern Collard for um, this this class just because it's an easy one to do and it's uh, super popular on a Kwanzaa event too. So um, glad that you're doing the no oil versions of that. So I think the, the biggest thing is to kind of look for the recipe that you're doing and try to cut back the oil as much as possible. And I do that on most of the recipes that I do. The lot key was a little different and that was um, my wife and I, when I was doing that recipe, we were like, wow, I can't remember the last time I deep fried, um, you know, but that was, latkes are kind of like the traditional way to do it. You can also bake them off in the oven, but a little bit different consistency on it. I've done those a lot of times where I call it the rainbow latke, where you don't just take potatoes, but you also take like carrots and zucchini and stuff like that. And it's basically the same kind of um, other dry mix that you use, but you bake it in the oven instead using no oil at all, which works actually really well, but you don't get the same exact crispy. Um, I don't own an air fryer myself, but that's actually been a great, uh, you know, recommendation from people to be able to do those, which I think would work really, really well too. All right. So our next question, how can I balance my menu so I can get the most nutrients out of our dishes? That's a great question, Mary. So, um, you know, I've got a couple little ones that, um, you know, they're not too picky eaters, but sometimes they just, you know, they're not big into salads, right? Uh, I don't know any one or two year old that's really into salads. Some are, but mine aren't. So I have to sneak some things in every so often. Um, and what I'll do is I'll actually take different vegetables and put it in. So, so like the latke idea with putting, um, you know, a... Uh, uh, you know, carrots and zucchini in there to be able to get some more uh, nutrients. That would totally, you know, uh, be something I would do. I also uh, sneak spinach into things a lot. Luckily, my kids love cooked spinach. So, um, but what I'll do is I'll put that into stir fries and different things like that. Um, you, we could have even added it into our lot keys or any of the other, you know, kind of dishes we do um, that I just kind of showcased here. But I think that that's part of it is, you know, you don't want to overwhelm the flavor profile with adding some of these other things in, but you can do that by adding other uh, ingredients in it. It doesn't have to be your, you know, typical spinach or things like that, but you can add in other things like chia, 
or hemp seeds to be able to get a lot of nutrients you might not be getting out of some of the other foods you're getting. I always like to say you should eat a rainbow to be able to get a lot, a wide variety of different uh, vitamins into your diet. Um, and some of those vitamins, if you're doing a plant-based uh, whole food diet, are a little hard to get. So I find that nuts and seeds are a good way to be able to get some of those nutrients you might not get from some of your standard vegetables or fruits too. But that's a great question. And, um, you know, when you're preparing your meals, so um, I think that's a good thing to be able to think ahead of time of what can I do to this to be able to make some of those other nutrients come into the dishes by adding other nuts, seeds or vegetables into them, I think is a great solution for those. So good question, Mary. All right. Do I have a favorite stuffing recipe? Um, you know, I do. My wife has been making it for years and I've seen her make it like thousands of times, not thousands, but a lot of times. Um, and I'm going to have to just go off the top of my head to be able to remember what it is. I do know that, um, oddly enough, she takes bread. Um, and we take a variety of different breads from, you know, like uh, baguettes and sourdoughs and stuff like that. And we lay them out on trays a couple days ahead of time um, out before the event. And then uh, they just sit out in, on the counters. And then a couple days later, we cut them all up into tiny cubes. And then we take, um, you know, a vegetable broth uh, that we've made from different scraps that we've had um, throughout the week. And then we'll add in um, thyme and rosemary. And I'll actually add in some mushroom powder as well, just like the the um, the mushroom gravy that I did at the, the very beginning of this class. Um, but a little bit of mushroom powder, which is basically just dried mushrooms. I usually use a mix of shiitake and button and blend them up to a powder. Um, but then we'll put that in with the broth, the rosemary, the thyme, a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper. Um, and then we'll saute some onions and then pour that mixture over the bread and then toss and put that into a baking container covered and then put it into your oven about 350 degrees for I'd say about 40 to 45 minutes and then take it out, uncover it, and let it bake another five minutes to be able to crisp the top up a little bit. Sometimes she'll even broil it off as well. Um, I don't have exact, you know, again, as she always makes it, but that's pretty much how I've seen her make it. So sorry, I uh, just gave my wife's recipe away. I'll ask for permission later. I'll, she'll, she'll be fine with it. Um, our next question is, is there a substitute for cashew nuts that can be used in recipes, typically for making vegan cream? My child is allergic to cashews. That's a great question, and that hits so personally to me. My daughter, um, my first daughter, was severely allergic to cashews her first year, two years of life, and we just got a, a test done, which she's not anymore. Um, and as a, a plant-based chef that did a lot of different cashew dishes, I had to really think on the fly to be able to make this happen. So, um, you know, there are a variety of different ways to be able to make those different kinds of creams, but it also depends on what kinds of creams you're doing. One of my biggest successes that I've found to also get nutrients in there, because I was also trying to get uh, a good protein source in there, was um, uh, cannellini beans. So um, on the last live event that I did, I did a... Uh, a uh, pasta dish where I used um, the cannellini beans instead of the cashews to be able to blend that up. And I made uh, carbonara using the um, cannellini beans instead of the cashew. And that worked great. It has a nice creamy consistency to it. Um, so a white bean would definitely be one of my um, go-tos, you know. Now, knowing if um, you have a child that's uh, allergic to cashews, we also want to avoid macadamia nuts um, and pistachios, which are in the same family. So, um, we don't want to go too far on the nut end when making creams, but uh, the almond is actually not related to the cashew at all. And that's actually something if you're trying to do like a cashew or like a, one of the cashew cheeses, I found that almond works pretty well with that as well. Sometimes I need to add a little garbanzo flour into it to be able to kind of um, help stabilize it too. But um, but that would be definitely me, some of my go-to. So um, if you're still looking for the fat, look for the... Um, the almond, uh, or if you're looking for the kind of creaminess for like a pasta sauce, go for the uh, cannellini bean. And I see Patrick just put a link to uh, the first live event that has that recipe in it. It's super great. I would highly recommend that. So I feel you on that one. Hopefully that helps you a little bit. All right. So Jeremy asks, could you air fry the latkes? Yes, you totally could. 
um, that would actually work. Again, I don't own an air fryer myself. I've got a li lim limited experience with it, but when I've used them to be able to do different things, they've worked great. And the lot keys actually would work perfectly in that too. Um, there's a little bit of moisture in the, the recipe that I showed you today um, with the almond milk. So it might take a little bit longer in the air fryer, but definitely experiment with it. Don't do all of them in one batch. Try one at a time and see how it goes. The recipe that I gave you guys on this, which is actually attached right below this video, you'll see event document. There's a, a link there. You can click on it. It shows you all the recipes um, written out that I've done today or links to the Ruby recipes too. There is also, um, you know, I, I forgot to say this about the stuffing. There's a great holiday stuffing, um, plant-based stuffing on the Ruby recipe site too. So if you log on to um, the Ruby and look at the recipes tab at the top there, type in stuffing. I think two of them will come up. One's plant-based and one is a traditional one. So um, great way to be able to look at those too. All right. So our next question. Since I no longer cook with eggs, my family is wondering if I'll ever have any form of Yorkshire pudding again, as they've had it for 30 years. Any suggestions would be greatly appreciated. That's fun, because um, my family used to do Yorkshire pudding for years as well, too. They would always do it with some huge meat thing, and I've been... Uh, vegetarian for 23 years now so i think it was some roast of some sort but um uh, the yorkshire pudding was one of those things that i, I missed um so yorkshire pudding is basically um you know it's kind of this thing that kind of puffs out to the side and i've never tried doing a vegan version of this but a lot of it is made from eggs flour milk and water basically and um there's a certain texture that comes out of that, which is very unique. Now, again, I've never made this before, but my first suggestion would be to look at aquafaba. And again, aquafaba is the, the water that the chickpeas are soaked in. And a great thing about that is you can actually make like a meringue out of it. So you can get like nice whipped peaks out of it by adding just a little bit of uh, cream of tartare to it, or even on its own, I've uh, you know, whipped it and it comes up to great peaks. So that's probably what I would start experimenting with is um, whipping the aquafaba in with um, a little bit of, um, you know, our, our other ingredients, right? So um, with a little bit of the uh, flour, um, a little bit of almond milk and a little bit of water to be able to see, and maybe to start with a muffin tin, you know, I don't, we always did muffin tins of them as well, but just try that to be able to see how it goes and experiment with that a little bit. Um, but that's definitely what I would, uh, experiment with. And I, I wish I had a go-to solution to tell you, um, you know, about a vegan Yorkshire pudding. Um, but I don't have one off the top of my head that I can think of. That's like, worked really, really well. Um, if you do a Google search on vegan Yorkshire, I've seen a couple that comes right up right away. So you might want to explore with those too. So Doug, thanks for putting that uh, Dan's original video on how to peel a mango. That brings uh, me back a while there. Thanks so much, Doug. Um, showing a little bit of history at the at Whole Foods there. Um, all right. So the seed loaf Ruby had for November holiday was awesome. We loved it. Well, that's great. I'm not 100% familiar with that, Catherine, but I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, that's one of the great things I love about Ruby is we're sharing all kinds of different recipes um, and ways to be able to improve upon them. If you haven't joined uh, the Facebook groups for Ruby too, um, or the Instagram groups, you definitely should because there's a great community out there of people that have gone through the classes that are sharing recipes with each other, their experiments on things to be able to see what has worked um, best for them. So I'm really glad that you like the seed loaf that Ruby um, um, did, gave out as well too. Um, all right, so what are the base ingredients you use to make a no meat loaf from Vicky? So Vicky, that's a great question. Um, you know, you can make all kinds of different no meat loaves. Um, one of my favorites is a chickpea loaf, and that's the base where you know I'm going to basically take my mirepoix, so my carrot, celery, and onions, um, and then cook it together with the um, the uh, the chickpeas, and that's kind of kind of be the base you know, for those. And of course, if I'm doing something in the holidays, I'm going to add like the thyme and maybe some rosemary. Um, or you could go some, you know, other directions with the flavor profiles on those. Um, other bases for the loaves are lentils are a very popular one. Because again, we're getting those uh, protein sources that are coming out of those as well. So lentils, uh, garbanzo beans, um, you know, seitan is a very popular one as well too. So um, the, uh, you know, 
that that might be a, a, an avenue you want to go down to. It depends on how you know you're defining kind of the the whole food plant based kind of thing. But I think seitan is a very popular one, so you might want to um, look into those as well. I know there are a lot of different recipes for different loaves out there, so really um, experimenting with what works best for you is the best way to be able to do it. So hope that answered for you, Vicky. Um, so from Rachel, can you save aquafaba? I always feel bad about throwing it out. Man, so do I. Or sometimes the whole can of chickpeas out when the uh, recipe calls for a tablespoon or so. That's really funny. Um, thanks, Rachel, for that question. So um, don't throw the chickpeas out. Definitely use them for something else. Make a hummus or, um, you know, the, uh, the non-tuna salad uh, that we do through the classes is a, a really great recipe to be able to use with the chickpeas if you're using aquafaba. Um, you can save aquafaba. I'm not sure about how long it is. Usually, um, just for safety reasons, we always say five, seven days is about the max you want to, um, you know, save something like that. But I'm sure if you look up um, some, you know, Google something on that, you'll find some good results for how long you can save it. But my recommendation would be five to seven days. Um, and, you know, I get it. If you just use the, t the tablespoon of it, it's a bummer to not be using it. Um, and when I'm doing it, I'll try to think of other recipes I can use on it right away for those two. But great question on that, Rachel. All right. So next we've got... Um, one from Kathy here looking for a recipe on pecan pie. Um, you know, so that is actually, I, I live in Texas right now, and that is a very popular option here. Um, the Minimalist Baker um, had a really good pecan pie recipe that I'd uh, had, somebody else had made it and said they got the recipe from there too. Um, and I think that's probably where I would steer you to for the pecan pie recipe. Um, uh, for that one, maybe with dates and maple syrup in place of sugar and caro syrup. Yeah, that's actually, you're headed right down the right path of exactly where I would go. Um, I'd probably stay on the path of date paste, or date paste and maybe mix in some ground up pecans into that as well too. The maple syrup is gonna give you that nice sweet um, as well. There, uh, There's a great pumpkin pie recipe um, that we have on Ruby as well. You might want to look into that for the crust or even the one that you do for the tofu chocolate pie. It'd actually be a nice kind of pecan crust for that as well too. So great. Thank you, Patrick, for putting up those boozy pecan bars, man. That's the one I was thinking of. Um, you know, that is actually, I think those are uh, bourbon infused too, which some bourbons coming up too much. It's not happy hour yet, um, but that's a great recipe and I really enjoyed it. So that's a great one as well. So uh, Marina, is the puff pastry vegan in the Wellington? Yes, it actually is. Um, there are a variety of different uh, puff pastries out there, but a good majority of them actually are vegan. Um, and that's great for us that are following plant-based diets because you can do a lot of varieties with those. Um, like for the one that was on the video here, I kind of laughed at myself because I overstuffed it and had to use another one. I ended up using the rest of that to be able to do some foldovers, kind of like a spanakopita, you know, where um, I did like a vegan cheese filling with some spinach in it too. It was really, really tasty. So um, that would be the one that I would... Uh, you know, kind of start with. So isn't puff pastry all butter? Nope. You're thinking croissant. Croissant is definitely uh, an all butter one, or they put the butter in between each one and keep layering up and layering up. Um, so there are a couple different varieties of vegan pa or vegan puff pastries out there, and I highly recommend them. They do have oil in them, just so you know, um, but uh, they are still vegan. Um, and what fat would you use in place of butter if you're making the puff pastry? Um, well, I'd probably use a vegan butter to tell you the truth. Thanks, Kirk, for that question. Um, but that would probably be my best alternative if you're actually making it. And, um, you know, and I've seen croissant made with the vegan butters as well, too. So I would probably go with something like that. Now, there are a lot of different varieties of vegan butters, and I've seen one specifically made for baking purposes. So I would probably hunt that down just a little bit um, to be able to, to look for those as well, too. Uh, and in the same line of questions, can I substitute phyllo dough for puff pastry in the Wellington recipe De from Deborah? Yes, you actually can replace the phyllo dough for a puff pastry in the Wellington. Um, I would not score the top if you're going to do the phyllo dough on it, though. Um, I, I guess you probably could, but the textures are going to be a little more different, right? So um, it will be uh, kind of uh, the texture is just going to be 
very different on the phyllo, and it's going to be a lot more flaky than the puff pastry. Will. And Megan's saying, isn't it heavy in oil, the, the puff pastry? Uh, yeah, it, it definitely has some oil in it. Um, that is on the, um, you know, definitely on the uh, the side of decadence um, for the holidays. There's a, a great, if you're looking for something that's kind of one of those mains, there's actually a great um, uh, shepherd's pie recipe on the Ruby website too that has a no oil version. So you can do the no oil um, mushroom gravy like I, I showed you and then do the mashed potatoes to be able to pipe over the top as well. Um, so yeah, if you're looking for something that's a little less in oil, um, that would probably be a, a good bet. One thing I always tell people too is with the Wellington, it's not like you're eating the whole Wellington, right? You're just eating a slice of it. Um, so you, you're putting all the other things on your plate at the holidays. Um, and it's, you know, a good way to be able to look at that just a little bit differently too. Um, is there a vegan turkey loaf recipe somewhere? Um, from Linda, I'm sure there is, but I don't know of one. Um, to tell you the truth, um, you know, I've seen them again made out of seitan as well. If there's somebody else that's on this that knows of one of those, we could um, post that to Linda's response there, but I don't know of one. And Linda, if you email me, um, we'll get back to you one. Uh, we'll get back to you on one of those two. My email address is just dan at ruby.com. So if you email me, I'll do a little bit of research for you and find one of those two, unless somebody on this thread uh, sees it right away and is putting it up. Um, all right. So the next one is, can you make a coffee cream from rice or something besides nuts? Um, from Helena. Helena, I'm not 100% sure we are going with that from a coffee cream. So if you're looking to, oh, like a coffee creamer, I guess is probably what that is. Um, and can you make it besides rice or nuts? Yeah, actually you could. There are a lot of different varieties. Typically when I'm making um, an alternative milk, I'll usually do it out of oats um, just because there's a less fat content in it as well. Um, and yeah, or coconut, but if you don't want the nut, that's probably not the best way to be able to do it. Um, so... Yeah, um, that that's probably, you know, I'm, I'm not a big coffee drinker either, but um, I would typically go with something like the the oat milk or um, if you don't want it seeds too. You didn't say seeds, so I would actually probably go with a hemp seed as well. It would probably be a, a nice one because it still has a little bit of that fat consistency in it. So just put it into uh, a high-speed blender with a little bit of water and blend it up. It's kind of the same way you make your oat milk as well too. Um it's definitely going to taste a little bit different than your regular creamer if you're making that transition over, but that's a good place to at least start with. Uh, so Joan, I can't get aquafaba to whip up using an electric hand mixer. Do I need more of an industrial mixer to get it to whip into a topping? So yeah, this, um, it takes a while. I, I've done it by hand and it takes forever. I've also, um, you know, added uh, tartar to it. So um, it's like a cream of tartar, which is actually still a, a vegan, um, you know, substitute basically that you can put into it. Um, I'm not 100% sure why it works, but just putting a little bit of that powder into it can actually help out a little bit. So you might want to try doing that. Um, otherwise, that arm is a workout and even with using just the uh, electric hand mixer it takes a while to be able to get it up to be able to get those peaks um i remember when i first heard of aquafaba doing this i was testing a recipe for actually chad sarno who helped develop the plant based system or plant-based class for ruby um and he had the meringue in there and i remember just whipping and whipping and whipping and, and i was doing it by hand and i was like this is not working um, he's like, I swear it works. And I kept going and kept going and finally started to see some texture to it. So it takes a long time to be able to get it going. An industrial mixer would definitely make it happen quicker. Um, but I think your electric hand mixer, maybe put a little bit of tartar in there might help it as well. Um, but yeah, just keep at it with that hand mixer and you'll get there eventually. What temperature and time dairy, uh, duration would you use no oil bake on the lot keys? So yeah, so the temperature, I typically would put it about 350 um, for the lot key and the time duration, they take a little bit longer to be able to do that. And I'm gonna flip them halfway through, but I would say at least 45 minutes and then test them as you go. What you're looking for is to be able to make sure that the center um, has been heated and it's uh, there's no more liquid kind of on the inside. So honestly, I always kind of, 
I'll take one of them and break them in half um, at the end of the 45 minutes to be able to make sure that um, there's no liquid left or there's no, you know, nothing on the inside of it left like that. So 350, 45 minutes, depending on where you are in the country or in the world, it might take a little bit longer than that. And if you want to be real crispy, it's definitely going to take a higher temperature and a little bit longer. So maybe 375 for 50 minutes or so. Just make sure to keep an eye on it and then, you know, take your sacrificial lot key, break it in half to be able to make sure that the center has been cooked through as well with those two. Um, great question there. So when I cook with chickpeas in an instant pot, does the liquid work as the same as the can? So kind of, yeah. I mean, basically what aquafaba is, is the protein water that is coming out. It's the protein that's coming out of the bean. Um, and for, you know, when you're cooking beans, that basically is what this kind of same thing is. I've only used aquafaba from a can. Um, so I would want to do a little bit of research before I did it in the Instapot to be able to be sure, but uh, essentially that is the exact same thing. So that's a great question there that we'll probably have to do a little bit of follow-up on, but I'm pretty certain it is the same thing. But great question that I'll follow up with. Hello, Chef Dan and everyone. I love making my homemade vegan mayo and usually use soy milk among all the ingredients. Is there a good substitute for soy milk um, and the vegan mayo? Thank you, Laura. So. Um, you know, if like for mayo, again, it's kind of, you're trying to look for that thickness, right? So like oat milk would not work on there. You want something that has a little more fat. So soy milk is actually not where I'd go first. I'd probably go with an almond milk um, or something like that, or a cashew milk, um, you know, to be able to start with those. So those would probably be my first substitutes that I would look for. It'd be an almond or cashew or some sort of nut-based milk. Maybe even a hemp would actually work really well. So that would be my first suggestion for you, Laura, and good luck with that. That's a great, um, you know, great thing to be able to do is making vegan mayo at home. All right, what can I use to substitute for the uh, bourbon and the boozy pecan uh, uh, pie bars? Um, from what I remember, um, let me just do a quick search on this too. Uh, to be able to look at the recipe just so I have it right in front of me here. Um, but from what I remember, you don't need to actually put the bourbon in it. Um, let me scroll down because every recipe has millions of pictures before it goes through here. Uh, do, 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 do. All right, so I'm just going to throw it out here what it is, the version with bourbon and without. So there are two versions on the Boozy Pecan Bar um, recipe. So if you go to that Minimalist Baker there, they're, they're going to show you two different versions, one with uh, the, the bourbon and one without. And it looks like the biggest change here is dates, right? So one heaping cup of pitted dates compared to um, one cup of pitted dates here. No, nope, maybe... Sorry, but yeah, but there are two different versions on here. So that's what I would do is just follow the recipe as she's put it there. It's a great website, especially for those vegan conversions. Um, hope that helps. Uh, Chef Dan, we also uh, plan unusual entrees for holiday meals between meals. It would be great to have an, a vegan dough recipe with little uh, refined flour, sodium, and um, no preferred to build a veggie pizza with. Oh yeah, your thoughts. Robert, so uh, Forks Over Knives actually has a great, um, oh, Patrick, you listed it already. Wonderful. We were talking about this a little bit earlier was the um, the, the plant-based oil-free pizza dough from Forks Over Knives. They're one of our partners with Ruby. They have a couple different versions of it and talk you through different um, toppings you can do with it as well too. So definitely check out the Forks Over Knives website for their, their pizza dough. Super great recipe, easy to follow. You can do it with a whole grain as well, which I love. So it's not a white flour, um, which I'm always trying to go with those as well too. So it's a great question on those. Oh, and Deborah, be still my heart. What's the best egg replacement for whoopie pies? I had a friend that specialized in whoopie pies for years and um, trying to find a vegan replacement for it was really difficult. Um, I found that golden flax worked okay, but they came out a little more dense than I like to, 
we tried applesauce as well. And what we ended up uh, really kind of coming up with, and I don't know the exact uh, amounts anymore, but it was a baking powder and baking soda combination. Um, just because you want it to be really, really fluffy and you need that, um, you know, like the meringue on the inside. Um, I ended up using an aquafaba for that as well, too. But it was a baking powder and baking um, soda combination for the cookie on the outside. Um, if you're looking for a drier version that looks like you might be, you might want to try the, the flax. And you can just go with a regular flaxseed uh, if you're going with chocolate. If you're going with a different, you know, like a white outside, go with the golden flax as well. But that's a great question. Um, and you still love those, um, but have refrained from eating any whoopie pies for a long time. Um, all right. So this isn't related to any holiday meal, but any suggestions on how to keep greens in the refrigerator without wilting? Any tips on how to keep parsley or basil fresh? Uh, with fresh herbs around. Um, I have no luck growing my own. So Deborah, that's a great question, and I, I love to be able to answer that. Um, the best way to treat, treat any fresh herbs like that, so basil, cilantro, parsley, um, all of those, is to treat them like flowers. So when you get them home from the grocery store or somebody else's garden, if you're not growing them, is to cut the bottoms off of the um, the stems and then put them into a glass of water, you know, so just take the entire thing and put it into your glass of water. So your leaves are coming out the top. Um, and then you can put that in the refrigerator just like that. It'll actually keep much, much longer if you actually keep them in there like that. It'll keep even longer if you take the produce bag and put it over the top of them in your fridge. It takes up a little space in your refrigerator, but they last so much longer than just kind of throwing them into a drawer or something like that. So that by far has been the best result that I've ever had from working in grocery stores for years too. Um, and that, that works really, really well. So treat your produce like flowers, those, uh, those fine herbs. They'll last much, much longer for you at least a week, which is great. Just cut off what you need as usual and then um, keep them back in the water. You might want to refresh the water every couple of days too to be able to keep them really fresh as well too. What is the best way to approach plant-based gluten-free puff pastry from Jeremy? That's a good question, and I don't know the answer to it. Um, the you know the part that trips me up on that is uh, I usually buy my puff pastry. I'm not making it from scratch, um, you know, often uh, or ever have I made it from scratch. Um, so I'm not 100% sure where to where to steer you on that, um, but. Jeremy, if you email me, I will definitely do a little bit of research um, and I'll find out what to what what has worked for other people and ask around to be able to see what works for you. Thanks for asking that question, Jeremy. That's a, an interesting one that I'll enjoy doing some research on. Um, thank you, Chef. Where do we find the recipes from Win? So the recipes can be found on the bottom right of the screen that you're watching. You'll see there's a little tab that says event document. And that will open up a, uh, a document that has um, the links to the Ruby recipes and the ones, you know, that I wrote basically for this event. Um, it's a great place to be able to get them. Um, and that's probably what I would, uh, you know, recommend towards doing as well, too. So, Jeremy, here's another question from you. Do you have a gluten-free fruitcake recipe that you'd recommend? Um, you know, if you're looking for like a traditional holiday fruitcake, no, I don't have one. What I would actually suggest doing is doing something along the lines of the raw uh, like apple cake that we have through Ruby, which is a great recipe from Chad Sarno. Um, that recipe is a great one to be able to build upon. Um, and you can take that and do other fruits in it if you want to, but it is more like a kind of a pie-ish kind of cake, you know, um, but it works really, really well. Um, as far as doing a gluten-free fruit cake though. Um, I think that you'd have really good results with using a traditional recipe for fruit cake and subbing out the gluten-free flour instead for that. Um, and then using some of our alternative uh, ingredients. So like the flaxseed eggs um, instead of an egg is your binder as well. But I think you're gonna find a really good success rate if you're just using um, a one-to-one -one ratio for your gluten-free flours going over to a fruit cake. If there's somebody out there that knows differently, definitely correct me on that. But um, that's probably just my gut is telling me that's probably would work pretty well on those two. 
Our next question here is we're new to plant-based eating. Why no oil, Janine? So that's a great question. So, um, you know, there are different classes that we teach through Ruby that uh, have no oil versions of them as well. Um, we basically uh, are avoiding the oil because um, the calorie intake um, is 120 calories per tablespoon of any kind of oil. So it doesn't matter if it's olive oil, coconut oil, or 10W40, don't cook with 10W40, but they all have 120 calories per tablespoon. Um, that makes it your calories add up very, very fast. So if you avoid the oil, you can um, avoid the calories and eat more nutrient dense food. Uh, oil is a very processed food, um, meaning that it doesn't really look anything like the original state. If you think of what an olive looks like and then the olive oil, you're not really seeing too much of a similarity there. So um, it also will show that it um, can spike in some of your other medical um, statistics as well too, but I'll just keep with the calories at the moment since I'm not a doctor. Um, but yeah, if you do a little bit of research around the no oil and plant-based whole, uh, whole food cooking, you'll see um, a lot of explanations around that, but that's the short answer for it. It's a great question on that. All right, so I freeze aquafaba in ice cube tray and it's just fine. Susan, that's a great way to be able to do that. So we did have somebody else uh, ask that too. And I see Linda said the same thing, putting aquafaba in ice cube trays and then zip, Ziploc bags freeze for months. I use tablespoon, tablespoon sized cube tray. That is a perfect solution for your aquafaba. So thank you, Susan and Linda for, uh, for giving that. That's a wonderful way to be able to do that too. Here's somebody else that added on there. Wow, we've got a lot of aquafaba comments here. Um, I saw somebody says that they use the uh, aquafaba um, from the Instapot and it works great. Um, I see here we've got, um, let's see, aquafaba from 2016 live event with Fran, which is great. Um, aquafaba sweet and savory vegan recipes made egg-free with the magic of bean water. Um, oh, the cookbook for aquafaba. That's great. That's actually wonderful. So and then Patrick put the link for it right underneath there. That's a wonderful link, Patrick. Thanks for doing that. And I do love that um, everybody here has the, you know, the ideas to be able to freeze them as well, too. Um, and here's another one. Here's uh, is her aquafaba is more concentrated than aquafaba from a can, which is probably why it whips more quickly in consistency. I use a KitchenAid stand mixer to whip aquafaba. Yeah, that's great, Diane. I actually typically use the KitchenAid for mine as well, too. I've done it by hand. It just takes forever. Um, you know, so if you have a KitchenAid, that's great. They're kind of expensive. So if, you know, the, whoever was commenting before, a hand mixer will work. But if you do have a KitchenAid mixer, use it. Just go towards it right away because um, it'll save some wrist strength for you as well. So our next one here is from Laura. What is a good substitute for nutmeg in general, in particular the yummy recipe with potatoes that you presented? I love that spice, but a family member just can't stand it, Laura. So the great thing about that nutmeg recipe in the lot key is you barely taste it. Um, I had a friend recommend it to me about a week or so before filming, and I'd never used nutmeg in a latke before. So I wanted to try it, and I tried it for the first time on camera, and um, it worked great, and you barely taste it except for a hint. Um, you know, I would also say that you don't need the nutmeg in it. That was um, just a recommendation for a traditional recipe that I was looking for and thought that that was a great way to be able to, um, you know, look at that a little bit differently. So um, the... Uh, yeah, so the nutmeg is not needed. Um, you definitely don't need it in the potato one. And if you're looking for other recipes for other things, like say the, the, the eggnog recipe I talked about, you know, just doing the cinnamon or maybe the cardamom instead, it'd actually be uh, a much better way to be able to do that as well. All right, so is there a sugar cookie that, whoop, no, I missed that one. So where can I find your email address? My email address is dan at ruby.com. So really easy to find me. Um, you can email me with any other questions that you have from this event as well too. Um, I'll be answering them for a, quite a while after these. I do get through every one of the questions too. So if you do have a question, definitely um, you know just send it to me after the event or right during the event as well. And I'll get back to you as quick as I can. Um, and I see our next 
one is, is there a healthy sugar cookie uh, recipe? Um, so sugar cookies are not what I would always say that's the best, or is there a sugar recipe that's healthy? Yeah, I wouldn't say sugar cookies are always the best as far as health wise go, but I get what you're saying. Well, you know, what we're trying to do is celebrate the holidays um, and do it in a little bit of a healthier way, just like many of the other recipes here. Now, typically, you know, if we're talking about uh, a sugar cookie, there is sugar in it. And that's kind of the big thing is there's going to be sugar in it. You can definitely use less sugar in it, which I actually do with my family. My cookies that we'll do with the family are very on, very like, they're not super sweet. Um, my kids, I don't feed them, you know, cookies like that very often at all. But when we do do them, we lay back on, on some of those. Now, the other thing that's in those sugar cookies, there's a lot of, is typically butter. And I would typically use a vegan butter as well, right? So um, there are a lot of different versions out there. Now, I haven't found a way to be able to lay off the butter as much, but I have on the sugar. Um, and then you're basically just putting the butter, the sugar, uh, uh, like a, a milk of some sort. I'll typically use a cornstarch and then um, some extracts, right? So either uh, a vanilla extract or something like that as well. And then I'll typically use all-purpose flour. I've done it with wheat flours as well, which you get a little sweetness out of it. But um, so sugar cookies, my, my answer on that would be, there, there's definitely ways to be able to do that, but I'll bet you Fran would actually have a better answer for that. Um, if she's still watching, she can comment back on that, or you can email her at fran at ruby.com for an answer for that. So um, I don't have a great answer for that, except for taking a standard vegan sugar cookie recipe and laying off the sugar a little bit more. Um, and I wish I could help you a little bit more on that. All right. So our next one is, what would happen if a no-fat pizza dough for puff pastry in the Wellington was used? That's actually a great question, Wynn. So um, that would basically come out kind of like a cannoli, right? So, or not a cannoli. Uh, uh, why can't I think of that right now? Um, what are those called? It's not a cannoli, but it's like a folded over pizza where you tie up the edge. I'm just having a brain moment right now that I can't think of what that word is. But um, so it would come out as uh, calzone. Thanks, Patrick, for doing that in my ear. Um, so yeah, it would come out much more like a calzone, um, which is great. That's actually my wife's family. That's what they do for the holidays is they make calzone. Um, and uh, so it would turn out just a little bit different. It would have a crispier on the outside, but you could still do your egg wash on the outside to get that nice color. Um, so that would be a great uh, alternative for the puff pastry. If you're looking to avoid the oil that's actually in the puff pastry um, or don't want to do the flakiness of um, the other versions as well, too. So that's a, a great, uh, great alternative for that. So Carrie B, what's a what was the site for the boozy pecan? So the boozy pecan one was the um, the minimalist baker uh, was that one. And she has some great recipes on there, especially for vegan holiday stuff. A wonderful um, person or wonderful website. Um, all right. So also looking at Philo Factory makes organic and spelt Philo a great substitute for Wellington. Yep, that's great. So it's a website that Mary just attached there. Thanks for uh, adding that in there. And then for Patrick for adding his the minimalist baker one. Um, for that as well. So a couple answers for that, for the boozy pecan par bars and for the, the phyllo uh, from phyllo factory, which is great. All right. Um, hey, Chef Dan, how do you feel about Ripple pea protein milk um, from Karen Small? I actually love it. Um, I know it's definitely newer on um, the scene, if you will. Um, but I use it for a lot of different things and I've tried a lot of experimentations with it. I haven't found a perfect recipe for them, but I've used it in substitutes for things. In fact, I think my daughter even does a pea protein substitute. You know, when she switched from breast milk to uh, milk being vegan, we didn't want to have like an, you know, an animal milk. So she does the pea protein instead. Um, and it's great. Uh, the flavor when you first start working with it's a little weird, so you have to mask it a little bit more, but um, yeah, so it's something that I love and have been experimenting with more and more. So if you have the opportunity to, I would definitely try experimenting with it. Uh, the nice thing is to have the protein in there, um, you know, uh, you know, where a lot of the milks like the almond milk have a high fat content, but the pea protein really ups the protein on it too. 
Wonderful. Um, so how would I remove the sweetness from jackfruit to make more savory dishes? Also, do you know of any vegan Mexican pozole um, from Celine? So uh, jackfruit. Um, typically, jackfruit, there are a couple different ways to get jackfruit. Um, and they're typically prepared a couple different ways. So one of them is being sweet and one is savory. Uh, there are a couple different varieties of them. So it might just be buying the alternate variety. And depending on where you're getting it from, that depends on if it's coming to work. I'm used to getting the savory one more than the sweet one, but I've seen the sweet ones in many, um, like at the H Mart and different Asian, like that was a Korean store, um, you know, here in Austin. But uh, I think that's just a variety switch. So if you're looking to be able to get those, if you're actually in a place where they're growing, um, you know, uh, you might want to try steaming it a little bit to be able to see how the flavor profile changes a little bit on it. Because, you know, if you're growing them in your backyard, which would be amazing to have jackfruit in your backyard, um, that would be uh, probably my first bet was to steam it to be able to change the flavor profile a little bit. Um, they're typically a little bit sweet, but they shouldn't have too much sweet. And um, even with the sweet ones, I've had a lot of success in recipes um, where, uh, you know, using any of those jackfruits will, you know, dilute the flavors down. And you're talking about Mexican flavor profiles there. So if you're putting in a little bit of chili powder and a little bit of cumin, um, those are great things to do. And your Mexican pizzole, you know, like that's typically made with a pork, like, product i'm not sure what part of the uh, the animal but um the jackfruit would actually be a great um you know great transition for that so um just the same way that they would um you know kind of combine all the things like if they're taking their pork you'd put in your you know your cumin your onions your garlic um you know and then put in your spices like your cayenne and chili pepper and some you know mexican oregano um i would typically put hominy in it too um and then put in all your other, you know, like your chilies and like, so the ancho chilies, jalapeno chilies. I mean, I'm just kind of doing this off the top of my head, but that's kind of your components of a pizzoli. So I'm sure you can find a vegan recipe online, but you can also go for an authentic version um, and look up a traditional authentic version and use the jackfruit instead of the pork. I think it would work really, really well. So, um, oh, great. So Celine, um, here, Rachel just answered, back. she loves the Mexican pozole from Superfood Soups. It has so many elegant, yeah, vegan nutrient recipes in it. So that's actually great. So um, and that would be a great way to be able to use the jackfruit that you're talking about as well, too. So great. Um, all right, from Catherine. I tried the tofu manicotti yesterday, and it was delicious. However, I did find that I missed the milky flavor of the traditional ricotta. How do you feel about using vegan cheeses on the market? Do you have any product recommendations? So that's a great question. Um, the tofu manicotti that we have on the Ruby website, I actually love a lot. I did it on our last webinar as well. I do switch it up just a little bit, um, you know, and uh, there are some components into it that, um, like I'll add a little bit of spinach to it, typically frozen as well. Um, and I'll add nutritional yeast, which I think we do in the Ruby one. And then sometimes I'll add a little bit of miso too. Um, just like a tablespoon to the mixture as well. And I think that that really helps kind of throw out the flavors really well. I've also seen that we add a little nutmeg into it as well. So nutmeg's just our theme for the day. Um, as far as vegan cheeses go, yeah, I mean, there are definitely great vegan cheeses out there, different ones for different uses. So I find different brands work for different things as well. Um, I know that uh, Mayoko does a vegan ricotta that is amazing, but it's also pretty expensive. So, um, you know, if you're doing a smaller dish, that's great. If you're serving a lot of people for a holiday, it could be a pretty expensive dish. So, um, you know, if you're looking for the alternative for that, uh, uh, you know, the Mayoko ricotta is quite good. Um, and I would highly recommend that one as well. Um, now for different, you know, vegan cheeses, I do use vegan cheeses for different things. I, I love the, in fact, my kids love the smoked, um, like Gouda. Um, I can't, I think it's Vile Life is the, the brand that they like on that or the Whole Foods 365 one or two of the sliced ones that they like. And for the shredded ones, um, you know, if we're doing like tofu scrambles, we'll do, um, I think it's Vile Life Cheddar Shredded too. It's a nice kind of meltable-ish one, you know, which melts kind of nice as well too. 
So, um, all right, Catherine is actually asking for a vegan puff pastry recipe if we find one. So Catherine, email me. I'll do a little bit of research on that and email um, anybody who emails me about the puff pastry recipe. And um, I'll, I'll do some research and find what I can on those to be able to get those out. So just shoot me an email at dan at ruby.com and I will do some research and find one for you. Thanks so much for that. All right, so Rachel, I'm getting an Instapot for Christmas. Yes, and how do you know that already? Have you been sneaking um, peeks under the Christmas tree? <laughs> um, what should I make first? Any good websites for awesome vegan Instapot recipes? Uh, the answer to that is yes, there are lots. There are tons of different um, vegan recipes out there for the Instapot. Um, the Instapot craze started a couple of years ago, and you'll find hundreds of books and websites out there about it. Um, I know a lot of our students use the Instapots for simple recipes as well. So making beans in an Instapot is one of those things that I've seen a lot of people use at great. Think of it like the pressure cooker uh, version as well. Those would probably be some of the places that I would start with an Instapot, would be to make simple dishes and then work your way up as your experience gets better with it. Because then you can work your way up to different stews and sauces, and then to do different things like a, you know an Indian doll or something like that into it. Uh, great recipes for those Instapots out there, um, and lots of whole food plant-based ones. In fact, I think Forks Over Knives came, came out with a supplement for Instapot, so that might be a great place to look for as our partner in Forks Over Knives Instapot recipes. Again, hundreds of them out there to be able to kind of look that um, look at as well too. So I see Fran gave us a response on this too. Hi, we have good, we have a good less sugary, no butter, cut up the cookie and essential vegan desserts and on my website. So Fran, thank you. I knew you'd have an answer for that. Um, for the, the less sugary, no butter cut out cookie. That's wonderful. So that's our sh healthy sugar cookie. Fran is wonderful at vegan, uh, pastries and, any any of those things, that's what instantly why I said Fran will probably have an answer for that. So if you're looking for that healthier sugar cookie, Fran is a person to look for for that. She has wonderful recipes on her website and an entire class on Ruby. So um, if you're looking to do something, um, you know, outside the norm of what you're doing in some of your other classes, her um, vegan pastry class is phenomenal and I highly suggest it uh, or highly recommend it. So our next one from Katie, how do I convince my whole food plant-based husband not to drink so many diet drinks? Turn the can around and show him the label. <laughs> um, you know, that's part of the whole food plant-based thing, right? Is um, I always say, could your grandma, could your great grandmother pronounce the ingredients on the label if there's a label, right? So if they can't, it's probably better to put the thing back. With uh, diet drinks, you know, I'm guilty of that. Years ago, for years, I drank, drank diet, you know, products like crazy um, and felt like a fog lift when I got out of those things, which is great. Um, there's a ton of research out there um, about diet drinks compared to sugary drinks compared to just drinking water, right? So um, I would start with a little bit of research to be able to show um, some of the things that are out there, you know? So there's a lot of research and that might be a good place to start. But if your husband is whole food plant-based, that might be a good place to start. Is this product really whole food plant-based? And the answer is no. So that's a good one that I would start with and then show a little bit of research to back that up. Good luck with that, Katie, because I know it's a tough one for some people to uh, quit those things. All right, Linda, what can be sprinkled under pizza dough to prevent it uh, sticking instead of cornmeal um, due to a cornmeal or a corn allergy? Thanks, Linda. So um, cornmeal doesn't always have to be what it is. You can also use, um, you know, flowers. Like if you're making, a, you know, the, the the pizza dough out of a flour that actually could be a good thing to be able to not have it stick to the bottom um and that's typically what i would do before the um before i would you know be able to afford other things like cornmeal if i was making my own pizza so that's that's what i would suggest is use the flour that you're actually baking with and just spread it out to be able to make it not stick um, um that's the best way to do that so Barbara, where are the recipes? The recipes are located right on the bottom of this video that you're watching. And uh, there's a little tab there that says event document with a little like kind of worksheet on it. So uh, 
Oh, okay. So Patrick just told me that the in the document the link didn't work. So he also added in the questions. Um, so all right. So you should be able to find them in the questions as well. Yeah. So if you scroll down, you'll see that the Ruby's wild mushroom gravy, no oil is in there. And the Ruby's maple roasted yams is in there. And that's just the two, apparently the top two links didn't work for some reason from the hyperlink. Sorry about that. But um, so the other ones are on the event document and the other ones are down here in the comment questions. And I'm sure we can update that over time. So if people are coming back for the recipes later, we can change that out. All right, so my Thanksgiving veggie loaf turned out a little loose. Do you think I needed to cook longer or do you think another error was made? Wondering if there's a benefit to drying out the veggies at all. So that is something that has happened to me many times over, more than I'd like to admit to. That's part of this journey that we're on, right, in the whole food plant-based journey. If you're making the transition, one of the biggest things you have to do is start to play with your food again. You know, so don't tell your parents, but you now have permission to play with your food. Um, and that's one of those things is experimentation a little bit. I actually don't think you cooked it too long. It might have been that, but typically, um, you know, the binder is the most important thing on those veggie loaves, right? So um, depending if you kind of deconstruct your recipe a little bit to see what's holding it together, that might be where it fell apart, literally. Um, you know, having some of those like flax seed binder um, things work really well. I've seen a host of different things def depending on what the uh, recipe is. I've even seen rice as some of the binders for them where you can take, uh, you know, like a sticky rice and uh, blend it up to be able to make it so it sticks everything together really well too. Um, and is there a benefit to drying up the veggies at all? So some people do say that if you're drying up the veggies because then the moisture doesn't actually release and let it kind of fall apart as much. I actually love, um, you know, having the vegetables with those, kind of the moistness to the vegetables because it just, it, for me, it adds a little bit more flavor and juiciness to the inside when you cut into it. So, you know, I personally like having um, the, the veggies, you know, in their natural state, but I've seen people dehydrate them and stuff to be able to make it uh, hold together. And then they rehydrate with all the other juices coming out of the loaf as well, too. So um, sorry, I don't have an exact answer for you because I'm not sure what recipe that you're using, but those are a couple avenues to look down is one look for your binder to be able to do it. If you overcooked a little bit, that might happen, but it shouldn't just fall apart on its own. Um, and check that out as well, too. So, Chef, any suggestions for uh, a meal other than three bean chili for a large group of meals, 50 to 100 people? I sometimes prepare meals for homeless shelter and always look to offer whole food, plant-based, and tasty, uh, fiber-rich meal. Karen, that's great, Karen. I love that you do that. Um, you know, uh, three bean chili is a great thing for 50 to 100 people, um, but I get it if you don't want to make that it all the time, you know. Now, depending on budget wise, um, you know, and what you're willing to be able to put into it time wise, you can make a whole host of different things to be able to make for those. Um, you know, the recipes that we made today might be a little too, um, too much, but you could also do things like the shepherd's pie recipe, actually. The shepherd's pie recipe that's on Ruby, um, I think it's on one of the comments here too that Patrick had put in. Um, is a wonderful thing that you can do in larger, uh, what we call hotel pans, our big kind of deep pans. And you can do the bottom, you know, and your mushrooms and the tops of the potatoes. So you're able to, to dip into it and serve it really easily as well. Um, and then I would do things, you know, as sides too, right? So I get the three bean chili. To, it's just like one thing to be able to put out. But, um, you know, a lot of people look at the sides as well. Uh, so doing some of those yams or some maple glazed carrots or something like that would be a great thing to be able to do. Um, that would be a great way to be able to, um, you know, serve kind of larger groups of those too. So, um, all right. Our next one's from Marianne. The recipe for the maple yams you demonstrated isn't in the event stock. Uh, and I can't get it to print. How can I get a copy of the recipe? So if you're having problems getting copies of the recipe, email me at dan at ruby.com. I'll send you a doc 
that has it on there. And we'll get this fixed by the time that the new recording comes up of it to be able to show that on there. Um, you can also go to the Ruby, uh, like if recipes, which is, should be at the top of your page there and type in uh, maple glazed yams and that recipe will come right up there. Thanks Patrick for tagging those to the top there. So um, there are the links to those recipes within Ruby or you can always search in those as well. You can also email me and I'll gladly get those to, um, to get those to work for you. All right, so from Geraldine, hello, Chef Dan, have you ever worked with uh, a Pandex tapioca starch? I've read that it helps to give lift to gluten-free dough, like the air bubbles from a form on pizza crust. Huh. Um, I. I'm not sure about the appendix, but I've worked with topia, ta, uh, tapioca starch before a lot of times. And you're right. It does actually help um, with those a little bit. It gives it also a little bit more sponginess, which is kind of cool. And that's actually more the uses I've used for it. I'm not knowing about the bubbles in it as much, but I've used tapioca starch um, in different uh, doughs to be able to give it a little bit more, um, you know, the most um, sponginess to it as well, too. So Teresa, the Cuisinart hand mixer, nine speed is the most powerful hand mixer I've seen. <laughs> it's amazing. So thanks, Teresa. I'm guessing you're talking about the uh, the aquafaba because man, that does take a while. And uh, I think that that's the best way to um, you know th th that's great if you can get the Cuisinart hand mixer, nine speed, awesome. Thanks, Teresa, and I'm sure Cuisinart loves you for that too. Um, all right. Hi, Chef Dan. I have a humble request for solutions to tempt the taste buds of adolescents who have cravings for all the Caribbean and Indian flavors and all things sugar. Any simple holiday sweet treats from this tradition that are whole food plant based? Karen, that's a great question. So, um, you know, there are a lot of different Caribbean and Indian flavors in those things, sugar. And there are thousands of different recipes around them. Um, you know, thinking, wow, I'm just trying to think of some of those recipes and a lot of them are already vegan as well. So um, I'm trying to think, uh, let me do a quick search here. And, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of these different, um, Especially, you know, I spent some time in India, and it's one of my, you know, I love doing India uh, food. It's one of my specialties. Um, and while I was there, I did find a lot of them that were vegan, too. So the the Galoob Juman, which is like a donut kind of thing, I remember is definitely a vegan one, but it is very sweet. Um, you know, the... Ah, a coconut lado would be a good one as well too. So, um, you know, it's kind of like a, like a date ball basically, but a, a little different Indian spice to it as well. So, um, and it's kind of like a donut and you can crush it in the, the coconut as well too. But, um, you know, that would probably be a really good place to kind of start. So, you know, you just basically start with your coconut um, shreds, do some cardamom, uh, full fat coconut milk, um, and then a little bit of salt and some coconut flour. And basically you can um, blend all this kind of up and then put it into a ball. And then you can, you can either, you know, saute it uh, or like do a fry on it, or you can also um, bake it as well. Traditionally they're heated, um, you know, in a skillet like that, but there are a lot of varieties to be able to look into that. And I know what you mean for the holiday sweets um, and that kind of tradition, because there are so many different ones. Um, but that's probably where I would start is kind of thinking outside the box a little bit and looking at some of those favorites and just tweaking them a little bit. Because if there are any non-plant-based recipes, they're typically going to be butter, right? Or ghee that they're adding to um, those Indian sweets. So that's actually an easy ingredient to be able to switch out to be able to make that work for yourself. All right, so from Dolores, any suggested plant-based substitutions to use in former favorite recipes that use chicken breast or thighs? Yeah, that's actually, uh, you know, I would probably go with a seitan. Um, the seitan is definitely a good uh, way to be able to kind of switch that out a little bit. And I've seen it work very well in, um, you know, recipes. Uh, I, 
there's a place in San Francisco called the Butcher's Son um, that I thought was amazing, the stuff that they did with chicken out of Satan. Um, and it's basically just doing, looking at it a little bit differently, right? So um, I would do the Satan and, um, you know, depending on your recipe, but you could also bread it really well to be able to get a nice crispy outside on it. Um, if you're looking to switch that up a little bit, mushrooms might actually be your solution as well. And if you're looking for a chicken breast, it might be a little bit harder to be able to find that exact um, flavor. But for your textures, you might be able to find some of the larger, um, you know, mushrooms will actually uh, appease to that. So depending on where you are in the world, there are some great ones in, you know, like the the Pacific Northwest, like lobster mushrooms and things like that, that would work really, really well for those. So my best answers would be mushrooms or seitan to be able to look for that kind of chicken breast or thigh instead. Um, and if you're doing a saute, you know, mushroom could work really, really well for those too. Uh, trumpet mushroom would actually work really well for that. Is there any vegan cheese or vegan mayonnaise that's oil free? Huh. Um, commercially, I'm not thinking of any that are oil free. Um, yeah, the majority of them do all have oil and mayonnaise is basically, vegan mayonnaise is mostly oil out of that as well. Now there are some vegan cheeses that you can make um, that, uh, you know, don't have any oil. Um, there are some cashew uh, based cheeses that we have on Ruby that are really nice that you make and then you roll um, in different spices and stuff like that. Those would probably be one of the places I'd look for some of those commercially. Um, they're much more artisan cheeses, so they're hard to find. So when, if I gave you a suggestion, depending on where you are in the world, um, it'd be pretty tough. I know there's uh, an amazing place here in Austin that ships. It's a, a vegan cheese shop, and I wish I could remember the name of it right now, but they'll ship to anywhere. But they specialize in vegan cheeses, and um, but they work on specifically like small vendors, which is amazing. Um, and some of them are oil free, but they're really small vendors. So, you know, if I was to tell everybody to do it, it'd be really hard to get it. Thanks, Patrick. Rebel Cheese, that's the one. Um, so Rebel Cheese here out of Austin, um, they're a great provi provider of vegan cheeses um, and they'll do whole charcuterie boards for you. And they do ship, which I found to be amazing because we did an event uh, on live stream like this where we had a cheese tasting and somebody in California participated with us because we shipped them the cheeses. So amazing stuff. So commercially, not a whole lot out there from small artisans, you'll find more. They're definitely um, less uh, stable. So you have to eat them quickly too. So if you are shipping them, eat them right away. Um, all right, Peggy, thanks. It says, uh, Chef Dan enjoyed the session. Happy holidays, wonderful. Same with Deborah, great session, thank you. Um, calzone. Yes, here's the answer. I can't think of that pizza fold over thing. Calzones. Thanks, Wynn and Karen. That is wonderful. Um, all right, let me scroll down here a little bit. Hi, Chef Dan. Have you ever used canned chickpeas to make chickpea chocolate chip cookies? If not, you must try them. They're delicious. From Sharon. Yes, actually, I have. Um, I first started experimenting with beans as our sweet as in black bean brownies. So if you've not tried black bean brownies, that's another one to be able to try out because those are fantastic and they're great protein rich, really good. The kids love them. So it's a great way to be able to get kids protein when they have no idea that those they're packed full of black beans as well too. So great way to be able to kind of switch those up a little bit. Um, what is a good substitute for tempeh or tofu? I don't like either one. Um, that's surprising because tofu typically doesn't have a flavor profile. So it might be something to be able to look at the way you're cooking on this, right? Um, tofu is made to not have much so flavor so you can switch the flavor really easily on that. So, um, Ray, why don't you email me and, uh, I'll give you a couple suggestions. Just tell me what recipes you are doing that you don't really like so much in them. Tempeh, I, I understand. Um, tempeh typically has a flavor that a lot of people don't like. The trick to getting rid of that flavor is to boil the temp tempeh before you're actually cooking it. So I typically will boil my tempeh for at least five minutes um, before using it in any way that I want to because it gets rid of some of that like kind uh, of 
sour fermenty kind of flavor that comes with the tempeh. Um, other substitutions for those, you know, they make tofu out of all kinds of other um, things too. So not just soybeans, they do the same thing with tempeh as well. So you can kind of switch that up. And depending on what you're looking for in these, um, you know, as just a meat substitute, there are a lot of different things that are out there um, as meat substitutes, like, like the seitan is one of those as well too. Um, you know, I'm not a huge fan of having gluten all the time, like in such a condensed form, but that is definitely something on those as well. And by far, mushrooms are my number one go-to. They have a great umami to them. There are thousands of ways to be able to cook them, and it's a great meat substitute that a lot of meat eaters even love. So that's probably where I would steer you towards. All right, so from Brenda, any suggestions for homemade plant-based gifts, like baked or ingredient mix. Oh, that's a cute idea. I love that. So um, yeah, you know, most of those, uh, you know, ingredient mixes, you know, you could do in a jar. So like even the pecan, the boozy pecan thing we were talking about earlier, you can separate all those ingredients right into some mason jars, just the dry ingredients and some of the pecans in another jar, and then maybe a little bottle of bourbon to go with that. You know, you could eat one of those little mini bottles of bourbon because it doesn't take much for that recipe uh, unless you're drinking it on the side. Um, but you can basically kind of combine those and that'd be a great little gift package, um, especially for friends that are just starting their journey on a whole food plant-based journey, you know? So that is a wonderful thing to be able to do is kind of take some of those, um, you know, especially the baker things where it has a wonderful thing that you can, you know, just combine them in and give them for gifts. All right. So from Patty, the Middlemost Baker has a recipe for almond ricotta, which is amazing. And I've also substitute that in the ruby manicotti instead of the tofu. I also like to act, add cooked spinach and spinach and mushrooms. I, I do that all the time for that recipe. And that's great. The um, Middlemost Baker comes through again with that almond ricotta. So um, if you're looking for that alternative, I can't remember who it was that was looking for the alternative for the ricotta. Um, you know, it might be a little cheaper doing your own almond ricotta instead of buying the Miyoko's one. All right. Do you have a plant-based substitute for Chex Party Mix, Brenda? Um, that's a great question because my mom just made it last week and my wife says the holidays don't begin unless you have the Chex Party Mix. Um, and you know what? I, she uses vegan butter on it. Um, it's basically onion powder and garlic powder where you put over the mix of what you want to do. We typically do the rice Chex so there's not a ton of gluten on it as well. We're not gluten-free. We just don't eat a ton of it. So um, the answer to that is a vegan butter. It's super, you know, not the best for you, but it's one of those decadent things. And like I said, you know, like my wife says, if you have that, you know, affinity towards it and it reminds you of the holidays, um, it's okay to, you know, make those changes. You know, just don't do them all year round um, and don't eat the whole bag. <laughs> all right. Hope that helps, Brenda. Okay, so Paloma, I need to do a roast for my hubby and he isn't whole food plant-based. Maybe a cauliflower roast for me for Christmas. Suggestions? Yeah, actually, a cauliflower roast would be wonderful. Um, there are a couple on Ruby that we do that uh, there's the uh, cauliflower steaks, which I think are really, really nice. And there are a couple different sauces you could do it. One of my favorites is definitely the chimichurri sauce. Um, it just adds a whole other herbiness and a lot of freshness to it, which is wonderful. And um, I'm sure if you made that, your husband might sneak over and get a bite from your plate and leave the roast on the side. So, um, you know, I think that the roasted cauliflower is a great way to be able to go. And, you know, the nice thing about that is it's like the loaves are great, you know, and those, but they take a little bit more work. The cauliflower, you can basically, you know, uh, put it in the oven get it to like kind of the texture you're looking and then just to a char in the pan on it. Um, and it makes a really, really nice uh, cauliflower steak. I've also seen people kind of do the same. Like I do one actually where I take different herbs and uh, roast the cauliflower just in the florets and uh, pick your own herbs for it. Like I've done a lot with uh, paprika and turmeric. Um, and then we'll toss it and then use the no oil roasting method on it too. Um, and that's a great way to be able to switch that up. And I'll do it with like, I'll shave carrots. So it's just like a, a peeler and then pickle those carrots. Um, it's a great way to be able to kind of serve with that and then put some capers in there. It's a nice little dish and I'm sure your husband will steal some from you. Um, what kind of white wine do you prefer to cook with? 
And what kind of bread? Well, that entirely depends on the dish um, and what kind we're drinking for dinner. <laughs> um, so for white wine for cooking, I'm typically going to pick like what I did with the Brussels sprouts. That was a super dry Chardonnay, you know, but you also don't want it to be an expensive bottle. You're not going to use like a, you know, $50 bottle of wine to cook with. A cheap white wine to cook with is fine because what you're doing is trying to get that aromatic and then you're cooking the alcohol off of it. There's no alcohol actually left on it after you're cooking it. So I usually try to get a nice kind of crisp wine um, to be able to cook something like the Brussels sprouts with. Now, if I was doing, um, you know, a mushroom, I might do like a Madeira wine instead, which isn't typically a white, but it has a definite flavor profile. And that's actually what we used in the mushrooms. Sometimes it might be a little bit strong, so I might use the crisp Chardonnay instead. Um, I'll typically use whatever wine that I'm serving with dinner as the cooking one as well. It's a nice way to pair the food so the flavors complement each other, but it also means I'm not opening a bottle of wine just for maybe a half a cup of the wine to cook with as well. And as far as reds go, it's kind of the same way. It depends on what you're cooking. Like if I were going to do... Um, I don't know, like I do a vegan version of Julia Child's mushroom bourguignon, right? So on that, I want a really deep, rich red wine, you know? So I might go with a burgundy or maybe even a Malbec or something like that if I was going to be uh, cooking that because you want the deep, deep, um, you know, flavor profile out of that so that uh, will penetrate into those portobello mushrooms and really help, uh, you know, make that stand out quite a bit. So it really depends on what your flavor profile is and what you're drinking for dinner too. Is the method of storing herbs that you suggested earlier good for rosemary sage too? And is that the best way to store fresh but not live basil? Um, yes, that is the best way to store live basil. Um, and for sage and rosemary, so sage and rosemary, they're a little more dry as they even start out. So um, you know, I've never tried it with those, but I'm sure it would work the same way. If you treat it like flowers, uh, they should should be the exact same way with those. I don't know if you would need the bag over the top for the rosemary, but you might for the sage. Um, I'm lucky enough for those are just a couple herbs that I keep in my garden, so I never have tried to store them in the refrigerator. Um, but I'm sure that they would be in the same way too. So Patricia, I have so much trouble keeping lettuce, kale, and power greens fresh in the refrigerator. Any suggestions? You and me both, Patricia. It feels like as soon as I get greens from the grocery store, they're starting to wilt as soon as I get them into the refrigerator. Um, you know, and I, I think it's just, a, you know, we're not getting them quick enough to the grocery stores. Uh, but, you know, I wish that there was a better way to be able to keep those. One of the big things that I always do is I don't keep my greens in the plastic bag, you know, um, I'll actually take them out and I'll put them in my crisper in the, the box, one of the drawers, um, and make sure that it's adjusted right for lettuces for those, you know, and so I'll take my kale and put it out into that as well to be able to keep them as fresh as possible. So don't keep them in the plastic bag um, and put them in your crisper in the refrigerator. It's the best way that I've found to be able to do them. But yeah, I, I hear you with that. Like every time I open a little package of spinach, I'm like, oh, um, I have to pick through this to be able to see what I'm going to be able to eat. So good luck with that, Patricia. We're all suffering with that one too. All right. So from Laura, I would like to make seitan like the ruby recipe made for class. However, I would like to use a different flavor profile. Will I be okay to simply maintain liquid ratios? Thank you. So yeah, that's actually, um, you know, one of the I grade the seitan recipes all the time. So I've seen a lot of different versions. And yesterday I saw one of the most inventive ones I've seen yet. And they did it in a Hawaiian style. So they had pineapple on the bottom and then they glazed their seitan with like a wine, like they were doing a roast. So the start is to get your seitan loaf, right? So um, in most of the time what we do for the ruby one, we're doing it in a, a pan and we're kind of making it wider out. Now what this person did was they made it more into a ball and it looked like kind of like a ham basically. And then, um, you know, getting it to that point is the most important part. And then um, glazing it, you know, what they did was they took um, 
what do you call those? It's like a roasting thing where um, it's like a big dropper, right? So you can basically take whatever marinade you're doing and then do it over the top. Now, what they did for this kind of Hawaiian version was they used uh, red wine, a vegetable stock, uh, maple syrup, and a couple other herbs. And um, they basically took that and, um, you know, every couple of minutes where it would start to dry out, they'd open it up and then glaze the top over again with their dropper using their marinade. So that is actually a great way to be able to do that. And you can completely switch up the flavor profiles for seitan. Instead of the one that we do um, for Ruby, I've also done ones with the dried mushroom powder on the inside um, or just sliced mushrooms on the inside where they're fresh mushrooms. Um, I've done my grandmother's Polish sausage recipe using seitan, um, using, you know, like fennel and all kinds of other, you know, uh, uh, spice mixes in them too. So definitely experiment with it a little bit because you can do seitan in a wide variety of versions, um, but you do want to maintain those liquid ratios. And if you're doing like the roast style, like this person did, you'll probably need more um, uh, of the marinade to be able to make sure that you're getting it uh, properly done. All right, so I like this recipe for vegan mayo. Uh, it's Jashi. So thanks from the, it's, I can't read the website. Is that from my, from my bowl? From my bowl. That's what it is. From my bowl um, at the vegan mayo recipe. So great. Thanks for sharing that recipe for the vegan mayo. Uh, all right, so when, what would you, whoop, I missed that. What would you flavor a hummus for flavoring of, for a flavoring of celery ravioli. So what would you, to flavor a uh, hummus for a flavoring of, I'm not 100% sure what you're asking there. Um, so are you looking to make a hummus taste like the ravioli? Maybe I'm missing something here. Let me do a quick search. Yeah, so. Are you filling the ravioli with that, I'm guessing? I'm not 100% sure. Um, so what would you flavor a hummus for for flavoring of a celery ravioli? Um, not 100% sure what you're asking there. If I were going to make a hummus to fill like a ravioli, um, I'd probably do like our garbanzo mix, but I'd do more garlic into it um, and do some Italian seasonings, right? So a little bit of basil. You could even do the whole leaf fresh basil, you know, in there, it'd be really nice. A lot of times I'll do the ravioli where I'll roll out the dough and then roll the basil leaf right over the top of it, which is really nice. Um, then you can do a really, really thin, um, you know, layer of dough over the top of that. So when you put the ravioli into the liquid, the leaf shows right through the top layer of uh, dough, which is really cool. But um, yeah, that would, uh, that's probably, uh, that's my best guess of how I can answer you. Shelly. Oh, so Rebel Cheese has a limited shipping area. Oh, wah, wah. Sorry, everybody, if you're trying to order from Rebel Cheese. Um, but yeah, that they're a great company. Um, you might need to travel to Austin soon to be able to, to get some for those. So sorry if you're trying to get Rebel Cheese if you're overseas or somewhere outside of Texas, which is pretty far. If you're it takes about eight hours to drive outside of Austin so um, to get out of Texas. All right. So, Chef, I was wondering if you had any experience cooking with some wild mushrooms, such as chicken of the woods, Celine. So, yeah, I love cooking with mushrooms. They are by far one of my favorite foods, and I have cooked many different methods and many different varieties. I grew up in uh, northern Indiana, and we used to go I'm in 10 acres of woods, and we used to go out in the woods and pick morels by the shopping bag. And I didn't, it wasn't until I was much older that I realized that that was amazing, where morels are super expensive. But Chicken of the Woods is another popular one of those. Um, and they're a great variety, the, specifically the Chicken of the Woods, um, because you can do great steaks out of them. Um, you can do like, you know, big size ones as well, too. Uh, different varieties have different flavor profiles and different textures, too. So some of them you can shred with forks to be able to get kind of like a pulled pork kind of look as well, too. Um, but yeah, the, the more different varieties of mushrooms to experiment with, the better. Um, like that's one of the reasons I love going up to the Pacific Northwest, because they have such a wide variety of mushrooms that people are just foraging right out of the woods. It's amazing. All right. 
Uh, so Sandra, do you have a recipe for oil-free chimichurri and or pesto? Uh, we do actually. The chimichurri recipe is on the Ruby website with the um, cauliflower steak. Uh, that's a great one to be able to do. Um, the oil-free pesto. I have one that I personally do all the time. And, uh, you know, it's a little tricky without the oil for pesto. So what I actually do is I will use more lemon juice, but then I'll put in a squeeze of lemon or of orange juice to be able to off-sweat the tartness of the lemon with the sweetness of the orange. So um, that's typically what I'm going to do with my pesto. And I actually sneak a lot of spinach into mine. So I'll take half of the, um, uh, the instead of um, all basil, I'll do half spinach and then blend that all together uh, with pine nuts, uh, a little bit of, well, a little bit of orange juice and lemon juice, a little salt and pepper. And that makes a wonderful pesto as well, too. All right, Chef Dan, where can I find the recipe for those plant-based black bean brownies? I've made them in the past, but eggs were a part of the ingredients and during that time had not made to switch to plant-based diet um, eating. Thank you. So the the black bean brownies that I'm thinking of were like 10 years ago on Whole Foods Market's website, and I think they might still have them. Um, let me check that out. Uh, Um, that's where I got it from was black bean brownies from, yeah, that's black. Oh, nope, that's not it. That's actual black beans. Um, I know it's a pretty popular recipe that you can find in a lot of places. Yeah. This is flourless. Let's see if they do no eggs. Nope, three large eggs right away. Um yeah, so that's originally where I had had that recipe from, and it was really, really great. And it doesn't look like they kept the recipe because, again, that was from 10 years ago. But I can see that there's some other ones like the plantbasedcooking.com has got uh, the vegan version of black bean brownies on there too. So a lot of different varieties of recipes out there. I would experiment with them and just kind of see which one works. Oh, it looks like Patrick might have found them, huh? Look at you, black bean brownies of... Zamus Madhouse Foods. Great. And that is completely vegan as well. So Patrick, I'm sure you will post that for everybody on this. Um, and we'll post that up at the top there. So thanks so much. Um, Paloma, can you suggest any creative ways to make polenta? Oh, I love polenta. Um, so polenta, um, the thanks for posting that black bean one there, Patrick. Um, can you suggest any ways for the polenta? So uh, there are a couple ways that I make polenta. One of them is, you know, living in Texas, you were used to Southern um, style, you know, polenta, and it's kind of more soupy, you know. Um, but what I like to do is I'll actually take the polenta, let it set in the pan and refrigerate it, and it'll become a harder consistency. And then what I'll do is I'll either cut that into squares, and then I'll stack up roasted vegetables on it, and then do a roasted... Uh, like a roasted red pepper sauce, um, typically over the top of those roasted vegetables. And I'll do like, you know, all kinds of things like carrots and red peppers and different, you know, root vegetables on the top um, and a couple herbs and then do the roasted red peppers over the top of that kind of square. The other um, one that I do is the polenta fries, which are a huge hit. So you make your polenta, put in some garlic powder and a little bit more onion powder. Um, let Do the same method, let it harden up and then cut them into fries. And then you can also coat those if you want with do like an aquafavo or a flax seed uh, egg wash on the outside and then coat them if you want to in like panko. You don't have to, but you can just cut them up and then bake them off um, to be able to make these amazing fries. And you can do like a marinara to dip them in. You could even go, you know, other directions like a peanut sauce or something to be able to do those. So um, as far as polenta goes and inventive ways, those are probably my top two that I use quite often um, to be able to make those happen. That's great. So Jeremy, uh, putting the greens in a freezer bag with a piece of paper towel, press the oxygen out. Yep, that's for greens. That's typically the way, um, you know, to be able to keep them a little bit longer. Um, I always like to put them empty, naked in the crisper, but uh, I see a lot of people put greens in the freezer bag with a piece of paper towel. Um, and no oxygen is an important part of that. That works for some people. I haven't had the best suggest. suggest success with it, but um, give those two a try and see what happens. 
All right, Nancy, thank you, Chef Dan. Very informative. Happy holidays to you and your family. You too, Nancy. Have a great, great holiday season. When what would you do to make uh, celeriac, celeriac ravioli? Um, so let me go back to that again. I can never say that word, by the way. That's just why I keep saying it wrong. Celeriac, <laughs> celeriac, yeah, that won't work. Um, Yeah, the short answer is I'd have to do a little bit of research on it for that win. But if you email me that question, I'll I'll get you a couple of versions of that too. Um, Laura, thank you, Chef Dan, for this helpful session and answering so many questions. Also, thanks for the participants who shared information. Yes, that's one of the things I love about this is our participants get to share a lot of suggestions too. So thank you for everybody for participating and helping to share some questions. And I think everybody did a great job of that too, Laura. Thank you. Christine, I've seen in my local nutrition nutritional food store a product called date syrup, and I'm not sure if this is a whole product or what may be used for. I'm thinking plant-based desserts, just not sure which. Yeah, so uh, a date syrup is um, kind of basically what it tastes like, or kind of what it, uh, I can't talk anymore. Um, it's kind of like what it sounds like. Um, it's basically kind of like a maple-ish syrup, right? but it's uh, the dates with a little bit of more water into it. So it's actually a pretty simple product to be able to make as well. Um, basically what you're doing is just a little bit of water, a little bit of dates, make sure that you actually pit the dates um, as well. And then you're going to boil the water and the dates, and then you're going to strain it out. And what you end up with is a really sweet syrup called date syrup. So is it a whole food kind of? ish you know um it's kind of like the olive oil right where we're taking the oil specifically out of the the olive so um we're not getting the fiber with it so not many people would consider it the whole food um but it's also not like a severely processed food you know so i would use it you know and still be okay with it being in that realm but that's basically what the date syrup is and yeah, you would definitely use it in desserts because it's so good. You can also reduce the liquid after you've actually made it too into nice uh, kind of a caramel-ish kind of looking thing. And it tastes kind of like caramel too, which is nice. Teresa, thanks so much. Great information. Wonderful. Glad we could help. Um, Robert Chocolate Covered, Kate.com's great black, black bean brownies recipes. Perfect. Thanks, Robert. Um, and the Silarec is on the outside instead of in the pasta when... Okay, great. We'll uh, help find that when you email me when I'm that Great. Thanks so much. Um, and lots of thank yous to everybody here. There's so many links shared in the Q&A session. How can we review all of them? I can't click on them. Great. So uh, Patrick is telling me that those will be in the archive copy. So all the links will actually be in the archive copy. When, we're, when we post this video, you'll be able to get all of those links as well, too. And great. So thank you so much and have a happy holiday. All right. It looks like we've gotten through all of our questions. So thank you so much, everybody, um, for joining us for plant-based holiday meals. I think we got through a lot of fun things here. Um, and hopefully we helped. If you have any further questions, you can always email me at dan at ruby.com for more questions and more holiday recipes. Have a great day. And thanks for your participation.